Westland view of forces covered by Mel Deaver. Started here. Wake this up. So we are actually a little ahead of schedule, so if you don't mind, we can go on. Beverly Paradigm. I'm wondering if he's in relation to the Paradigm acting dynasty. Keith and his brother, and there were two or three brothers, his dad. The dad was in the movie, The Grapes of the Wrath. Well, let me give you a little info on Beverly Paradigm. I'm using the Historical Dictionary of the Holiness Movement, edited by William Cosley. He was a long time, he was originally from Wisconsin, and he was finally was able to go back home after he retired. But before that, he was at the Church of the Brethren Archives. One of the subjects in Chicago before that. He was a professor at uh, Tabor College in Central Kansas. But I was told that Beverly Caradine has a very balanced approach. Some of the people who talked about holiness in the 19th century were almost extremists. Some of them were what you would call fanatics because their view of holiness was very few people are going to get it. So it's kind of a balance. I guess the other approach would be everyone's holy. And the other one is no one's holy but me. So those are the two extremes. So Beverly Caradine, of course, has an approach. He was born in the state of Mississippi, in Yazoo County. On 4 April, you see the dates there, 1848. And he died in West Montgomery, 23 April, 1931. He was originally with the Methodist Episcopal Church, but he joined the Methodist Episcopal Church South. Of course, being in Mississippi, that's what the church he did, uh, joined. And just to be <coughs> aware, that there are some areas that are covered by both the Methodist Episcopal Church and M.E. Church South. And this is even prior to the Civil War. And one of those, those, and those especially are the border states. Missouri, Kentucky are border states. So there are places in even St. Joe where if you look at the history, that church used to be M.E. Church South. And they're in the same town, same way with Kansas City. But there usually was that Mason-Dixon line that route was drawn across, and so generally, I'm sure Michigan probably didn't have any to, didn't have any ME Church South congregations there. I guess in, yeah, in New York was. But after the Civil War, a lot of ME Church missionaries called carpetbaggers went south because they felt like they had finally perfected the message of Christian perfection, so they took it down there. After the Civil War, the lost cause, all those people who had lost the war in, in uh, Dixie, they went down there to teach them. And also, they started colleges, and they started churches, because they had more money. And as you know, whoever wins the war generally has more money. The person who loses the war usually doesn't have much left. So the Southerners were kind of waiting, and they received a lot of help, as well as uh, missionaries from the North. So let me continue. He's been involved. The minister and evangelist Beverly Caradine was converted in July 1874. That would make him 26 years of age. He was licensed to the ministry of the Emmy Church South. Later the same year, he was assigned to an isolated rural circuit. And anyone knows, knows what that is, right? Isolated rural circuit. My DS, my former DS, she posted a picture on her Facebook page of her car covered with gravel dust. And she says, uh, 
I know I didn't have an accident. I'm just out on the beat. I'm out on the circuit, and some of those have gravel roads. And also, he was a person that rose to prominence very quickly. He became pastor of a prominent ME Church South congregation in New Orleans, 1882, and established a reputation as a powerful preacher and social reformer. He was praised for his active participation in campaigns to prevent cruelty to children and animals, and his attacks on the highly profitable Louisiana lottery led to the lottery's demise and earned him a national reputation. Carradine experienced entire sanctification June 1st, 1889 and 1890. He became pastor of a large Emmy Church South congregation in St. Louis, Missouri, where dismissing his previous reform activities as the imperfect social engineering of an upwardly mobile aspirant to high ecclesiastical office. He angered wealthy parishioners and denominational leaders with his attacks on the dress, lifestyle, and social activities of upper class urban Methodists. 1893, Caradine entered full time evangelistic ministry, became a popular and influential preacher, speaking at camp meetings, holding revival services throughout the U.S. and England, until he was injured in an accident in Seattle, Washington and forced to retire from the active ministry in 1918. He edited The Christian Witness, The Gospel Herald, Way of Faith, and wrote numerous books, the most important of which were Pastoral Sketches, Sanctification, The Sanctified Life, and Living Illustrations. His autobiography, Graphic Scenes, was published in 1911. Among his descendants are several prominent American stage, television, and film actors, bingo. That answers your question. Yes, it does. The Caradines are related. I wish I could remember the dad's name who was in Grapes of Wrath. With, uh, you know, we're, all, we're all drawing a blank on that one, huh? So, I'll look it up, what you're doing. Okay. He played Casey in that, in that movie based on, of course, John Steinbeck's Henry Fonda played the main character. David. David. David's the dad. Okay. All right. I want us to get our books and start looking at it together. And I have already started reading and made some notes, so we'll share those, and we will add to the notes that we have. We'll probably spend some time just looking at it and trying to see how he defines holiness. What is the title of the book? The Sanctified Life, Cincinnati, Office of the Revivalist. And the Revivalist, of course, is related to God's Bible School. And that's, of course, where our friends, the Cowmans and the Kilberts, are hanging out at that time. And also Oswald Chambers, too. That's right. Yeah, he was a lecturer, a visiting lecturer. Okay, let's, let's get into this and go through it. He's starting to, just as our other book, presents alternative views of holiness. Remember the four, and some of you have already signed up. We've got Reformed, Pentecostal, Keswick, and Augustinian Dispensation. So we've got these four alternative views. He also says, you know, there are some people who are talking holiness, but they don't really get it. They're not really on the same page as Wesleyan holiness. And he calls them different theories. So the first page in our Sanctified Life, chapter 1, page 5, he says it's a, it's a pity that some people do not study the meaning of the word regenerate. 
And he says, regeneration. Okay, let's start at the top here. This is a good part. The Savior in his Sermon on the Mount said, Blessed are the pure in heart. Can anyone believe that Christ would bless a class of people who do not or cannot exist? If men so insist that they do, then do they make the Savior utter an absurdity. So if he's talking about being perfect, there must be some perfect people. And of course, being perfect involves what? A new heart and pure heart. New heart is symbolic of being born again. New heart. The pure heart is the second work of grace, and that is sanctification. It is well to remember, bottom of the first page, page 5, that a new heart is one thing and a pure heart another. Next page. So the new heart comes with, this is line one, two, three, four. The new heart comes with regeneration, the pure heart, by the baptism of the Holy Ghost and <laughs> of fire. Now, I'll be honest with you, in holiness circles, scholars of the holiness movement, there is much controversy <laughs> over this issue. And I can't, I can't even begin to name the titles of the... Uh, articles that were written and published in the Wesley Theological Journal because some people said that Wesley himself never used the word baptism with the Holy Spirit. That rather he talked about Christian perfection. And that baptism in the Holy Spirit was his named successor's theory or contribution. Who would that be? John Guillaume, John Guillaume de la Fisher, and John Fletcher. The Swiss, raised as a reformed uh, person, he became a follower of working with John Wesley from Switzerland, and he wrote about baptism with the Holy Spirit. So you see that word being used easily, and remember, what is the date of our work here? 1897. This is a title that was very prominent. Baptism of the Holy Spirit was a term used, baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire, based on Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Matthew 3, 11. One is coming after me who is greater than me, whose latchet or straight uh, sandals I'm unworthy to loosen. He will baptize you, John the Baptist speaking, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So this became the standard metaphor taken from Scripture to talk about sanctification. Now when the Pentecostals showed up, maybe four years later, they used it also because they were part of the holiness movement, but it became very uncomfortable for many holiness <laughs> advocates to be using the same language as Pentecostals. Why? Because when a Pentecostal mentions baptism with the Holy Spirit, what are they talking about? Speaking in tongues. Glossolalia. Glossolalia. Pomelo. Because that is the sign. Yes, sir. Just to point out to the students that unlike the other pages, these are arranged like Hebrew pages. They read right to left. Oh, really? So page five and then page six is the other side. Uh -huh. And so I just wanted to make okay, sure. Okay, good, good. So just make sure you got the right page. Thank you. Because I've got an old one. I printed up a couple myself, and that's the ones I marked all over the place. So the new one is clean and nice. But this one has my notes. So he started to compare this new heart and new, a pure heart. New heart is regeneration. Pure heart is baptism with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now. He's starting to talk about alternative methods, or he calls them theories. So page six, second half of the page, the second full paragraph, the uh, one alternative is what? One is the purgatorial theory. This, as is well known, is held by the Roman Catholic Church. So this theory is that the person will go through a time of fire and the impurities will be burned away <laughs> the most common term that is used among Catholics is purgatory 
And if you recall from your, your Western Civ days when you read Dante's Inferno, he has three volumes, Inferno, Purgatorio, and what? Paradiso. So hell, purgatory, and heaven. Those are the, in English. So when you talk about purgatory, do you guys believe in purgatory? Most Protestants do not. The Catholics do. So because there's a belief in purgatory, what is the, one of the distinguishing marks of Catholicism as compared with Protestantism? For example, at the funeral. How many of you are admitting that you have Catholic relatives? You go to the Catholic service before the actual funeral service, which most likely would be a mass, funeral mass with the priest, they pray the rosario, the rosary, the beads. Why do they do that? The person's dead. There's nothing that dead person can do. Why do they pray the rosary? There is a possibility of the dead to right. forgive them. That's why for the view of probable theory, it's a stage between um, hell and yes. heaven. Right. Yes. right. And for Catholics, the actual. So it's like a hello. So they pray so that. The death must go, must purify their sin. Yes, good. Sin. Purify, purify their, their sins, sins. purge so their they sins. Get to the so they can go to heaven. Thank you. And actually among most Catholics, if you check their, their uh, belief system, especially in the catechism, the modern catechism, they really don't believe many people go straight to heaven. Most people go to purgatory. So maybe, maybe Mother Teresa. She was in heaven. Maybe Pope John Paul II was in heaven after he died. But other than that, most Catholics go to purgatory. And they need your prayers. They need the family to pray the rosary. And also, the family, if they have money, will give a large check to the priest. And what will they tell the priest? Please, say some masses for my uncle, for my mother, for my father. And here's the money, here's the offering to the church. And every day he gets up and he says a private mass, and he will mention your uncle's name, and I'm doing this, and that way that person can be released from purgatory to heaven. So the purging. Now, we do not have, we do not have an official doctor of purgatory. And of course, people always, when someone passes among Protestants, what do you say to the congregation? Please pray for the soul of the departed. Please pray for the family. Family. Yeah. And sometimes people will slip and say, please pray for so and so they just passed away. Yeah. But generally everyone knows you pray for the family in this loss. And as a result, we have this, this view that the blood of Jesus Christ is only part partial payment. We need to add our prayers to that. We need to add merit to that person's life so we can get that person from purgatory to heaven. Now, he's saying, of course, this is wrong. This is Roman Catholic, and he's, he's pretty much uh, dissing this. <laughs> but I'm wondering if <laughs> some people don't believe that there is a relationship between human suffering and a person's spiritual life. Sometimes we, we can just dismiss a, a, a view as Catholic, when really I think in, among Protestants, we have an understanding that someone has suffered a lot. If you persevere in suffering, it develops character, which you also Amen. 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 And so this is a virtue, and this is something that God is looking for. And some people, we, we call them saints. And in fact, people will say, well, she was a real saint or he was a real saint. They went through all this suffering. So we, can't, we shouldn't just kick this out, but it is a Catholic view primarily. Next theory is on page 7. Second opinion held is the
page seven, the second opinion held is the death theory. Death theory. And as I read through this, sin is in matter. I could not help but think of Platonism and Neoplatonism. And I'll be honest with you, I knew a guy in the army, I hate to tell war stories, but he was living a terrible lifestyle, a very sinful lifestyle. And he told me he was a Christian, he was going to heaven. <laughs> and I asked him further, I said, how do you see that? Your, your lifestyle is very, very corrupt. And he said, I am just doing this sin with my body. My spirit is not involved in the sin, only my body. My body doesn't count. It's just junk. It's garbage. So when I die, it will be burned up. It will be discarded. So my spirit is what is eternal, so I can do what I want with my body. That's new, the old plate. New definition. Yeah. But, the, but the death theory continues also with this idea, not only that sin is in matter, but that what? Purity or holiness can only come at the moment of death. And some people, of course, will point to what part of the gospel? The passion narrative. The conversion of the thief on the cross. Remember me, Lord, when you come to your kingdom, kingdom <laughs> paradise. And I guess I will remember today you will be yes. with me in yes. paradise. So this man had a deathbed conversion. And a lot of people, to be honest, some theologians have trouble with this because you have to say, well, he what kind of a lifestyle did he use all those years? He's, he's up on the cross, and he even told the other guy who was rebuking Jesus, he said, hey, we deserve what we we're getting. This man has done nothing. And they are thieves. And the penalty for stealing like that, and some people would even <laughs> go on and say that they were actually kind of leading a revolt against Rome. So they were uh, insurrectionists. But we deserve this. So if I was thinking about this, if death is the moment that you can, at that instant, think about this. When someone dies, do they know they're going to die? Sometimes, sometimes not, right? Sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes a car accident, sometimes a sudden heart attack, it's just, they're dead. Just a minute, just even seconds. But if someone knows that they are not doing well health-wise, and they'll probably die in another month or two, what about Dr. Death, your friend from Michigan? You remember him? Oh, yeah, Kevorkian. Kevorkian and assisted suicide. So I put this on page eight. I was, I, I, on the, in the margin, I put, well, if this is true, what about suicide? Because you can get to heaven real fast. Are there some <laughs> religious traditions that believe that? Huh? I'll ask Dr. Vermillion to jump in here because he was in Vietnam and for, there, there were some Buddhist monks who were self Immolation themselves. They poured gasoline on themselves. They lit it, and they were on fire as a protest against the Vietnam War. And I think, if I remember correctly, there was even a Quaker in the states who did that. I More than so. one, I think. Yeah, several Quakers did that. <laughs> and so, they, as a matter of protest, are there others who commit suicide as a matter of protest or a religious right? I think so. I think so. In Islam, if you kill others, you will go to God. That is correct. That's why right. the suicide bombers, they blow themselves up. Yeah. And they think that we will go directly to heaven. Go directly to heaven. And Allah will welcome us. So if, it, if the end is the end, then we might as well bring it on. Let's get it over with. Get to heaven. But there's going to be a rude awakening. What's the third one? The bottom of page eight. The third view is the Reformation theory. Those who hold to this simply bid men to quit their badness. The exhortation is to stop doing wrong, join the church, lead a moral life, and the first thing they know, they will be clean and pure. Does this work? <laughs> His illustration is really great. Yeah. 
Does this work? White washing and washed white. I love that. Yeah. White washing and washed white. Jesus washes white. The world whitewashes. And also the Reformation business is only skin deep. It's a skin deep matter. It is manners rather than morals. You change the person on the outside and not on the inside. So I put on my side and be feel free to mark on this. I put behavioral modification. Behavioral modification. And this is true, I think, in many of the 12 step programs. I'm not I'm not denying that people have been able to successfully get off drug get off drugs and alcohol or gambling because of the 12 steps but a lot of it is trying to train yourself to think a different way and to act a different way so it's kind of behavioral modification so can you teach someone to do the right thing and they will be successful and they will be in heaven soon <laughs> Anyone know what Jeremiah said? The heart is the seal above all things. Who can know that? The heart is deceitful. So all this behavior modification, the heart is wicked. Change your heart. Originally, what did he say? You need a new heart and a pure heart. Amen. Let's go on to the next one. Number four, that's on page ten. A fourth view is the Zinzendorfian theory. This teaching affirms that purity is obtained in regeneration. Now, when you remember the life of Wesley, he was really curious about the Moravians, especially on the ship over to Georgia. He saw that they had real faith, so when he got back, after he got in trouble in Georgia and had to go back to England, he wanted to go meet them, and he even took that journey to Germany. And yeah, I think he did meet Zinzendorf. But he found out these people think that when you get saved, you get everything, all at once, all at once. So can you imagine having that kind of an experience, you get it all at once? And of course, a lot of people say, well, this is not according to the Bible. But I can say there are a lot of Christians who follow this. Yes. A lot of Christians. So when you talk to them about a second work of grace, they say, why do I need a second work of grace? I got it all. I got it all. And for the early Pentecostals, there was a fellow from Kentucky by the name of William Durham. And somehow he stumbled across... Zinzendorf, and he called it the finished work theory. He said you get saved, you also get sanctified at the same time. The only thing you need to do now is get baptized with the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, you get the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and the only thing you need to do is have the baptism. But my argument with that view, and this is held by many of the Assemblies of God, Assemblies of God, and International Church of the Four Square Gospel, my argument with this is, if you get it all, why do you even have to talk about baptism with the Holy Spirit? If you get it all when you're saved, why do you need to even wait for anything more? So, if they would say, oh, no, 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 you need to have speaking in tongues, you need to have the baptism. Well, didn't you get it? And this is controversial because some people believe, I don't need a second experience because I got it all. And I've heard that too many times. Yes. And then they say, well, what about these people who talk about sanctification or baptism in the Holy Spirit? Do you not have the Holy Spirit? And of course, four spiritual laws, if you remember, Bill Bright came out with that one, have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Next one, we won't talk more about Zinzendorf, you already know all about that. What's the next one? But, sir, before we move on, it, it seems to me in my experience, people often combine Reformation and Zinzendorf together. Yes, yes. So, yeah, that's true. The, the fifth one is on page 12. Growth theory. Growth theory. 
Many thousands hold to this in all the different churches. Their position is that pardon and spiritual life are realized in regeneration, <laughs> but holiness or entire sanctification comes as a development. Whoa. This is the most popular. If you remember right, P.U. Palmer, her way is called the short way. But there are more and more Wesleyan scholars, scholars of Wesley. Randy Maddox happens to be one. That hold to a growth. And they said, you know, sanctification is not instantaneous. It's not get up to the altar and snap your fingers. I've got it. And I'm going on. But it is a lifelong process in growth. And this is very influential, I think, among those who are studying at Methodist seminaries and others. So that is why there is less emphasis on tarrying and testifying and you know, getting to the altar. There's more emphasis on the lifelong. And of course, we have to realize there is a part of the Christian life that is lifelong. There is discipleship. There is spiritual formation. Important parts. But to think that we can't receive something now as a gift is to, I think, disregard the teaching of Scripture. Because God wants to baptize us, fill us with His Spirit. And sometimes it's a process, sometimes it's an instant. So we can see kind of the combination of the growth theory. It's way over yonder in the future somewhere. So it's not going to happen in my life. It's going to take forever. Embarrassing fact that they cannot present a single instance of a Christian coming into this blessing by development. Everyone who testifies of having received this blessing says, I got it on this day. I was at this church. I went forward. It happened to me there. I was at work. It happened to me when I was in prayer with some friends at a small group. So they can give you a time and a place. Lots of illustrations along the way. Next one. Yes, very good. Page 15. Again, there is the imputation theory. You guys write numbers on this? Yes. So now that's number six, right? Seven. Seven. Bishop, you are getting this. Imputation. Anyone know the difference between imputation and impartation? versus impartation. Imputed sanctification or holiness is very similar to the idea of imputed righteousness. It's a view of Calvinism. It's a view of reformed Christians. And it comes from what we call forensic theories of the of salvation, soteriology, redemption. And it's almost like you go before the judge and he has the gavel and he declares you innocent. Not guilty, innocent. So he's declared you righteous and therefore you are righteous. So it's a matter of a name. It's a matter of a declaration by a judge. Imputation. Well, what's impartation? This is Wesleyan. Wesleyan. And of course, he doesn't talk about the difference, but imparted. Imputation is a very external thing. It's like giving a person money. It's a transaction. Legal tra you give someone money. Impartation means you have money that buys something that puts is put into your body, like medicine. So this is a declaration. You are healed. And people say, well, it sounds good, but I don't feel like it. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it really has taken in my life. And imputation, again, is a reform view, but the Wesleyan view is that you are healed 
and God has done the work in your heart, impartation, internal work of the Lord. Okay, now so we have seven views that are all false. Now we move to the next chapter, the true theory. So let's look at that. Someone read that first paragraph so we can get, this is a good definition. If you want to use this, you can be free to use it. Maybe adapt it a little bit. Someone read that. The true theory of entire sanctification is that it is an instantaneous, instantaneous, instant, instantaneous work of God wrought in the soul of the regenerated man or woman in answer to perfect cons consecration and swearing faith and importunate prayer. Amen. Okay, I, I'm not going to put uh, Dr. Freeman on the spot, but does this sound similar to the Wesleyan statement? I, it sounds like the Nazarene statement, too. Yeah. Very similar. Very similar. And so a lot of the, the instantaneous work is very key. Now, sometimes they will say uh, subsequent to regeneration. But I think we get the understanding here that it's brought in the soul of the regenerated. It follows regeneration. And I love this part. In answer to perfect consecration, unswerving faith, in, in importunate prayer. So God is looking at us and he's saying, hey, you've done this. So here is the gift of the Holy Spirit after you pray. Some people would say this is works oriented. I would not say so. Some people say work is, uh, is actually, prayer is work. Some of your extreme Calvinists. And they would even say even to ask Jesus into your heart is wrong because you're not supposed to do anything. Of course, you know the expression. I think I did I share it with you, Lorenzo Dow. I wish we had time to include Peter Cartwright and Lorenzo Dow, some of the most famous circuit riders in the Midwest. Peter Cartwright mainly in Illinois, Lorenzo Dow mainly in Indiana. But Lorenzo Dow went over to spend a lot of time in Ireland and started the primitive Methodists over there. He was a very, very wildfire preacher. And he was talking about Calvinism. And he said, damned if you do, damned if you don't. That's not, that's not the phrase my mom invented. My mom used to use it all the time. And damned if you do, damned if you don't. <laughs> but that is from an evangelist talking about Calvinism. And he said, it doesn't matter what you do or what you don't do. If God has made up his mind, there's no budging. There's no conversation. It's a done deal. So if you are, in a sense, designated for salvation, predestinated, I should say predestinated, God's plan is that you're going to be saved. You don't have to do anything. You go out there and hit every bar in town tonight and never never actually do anything right and still you're going to go to heaven. And if you and also if you try everything, including prayer and God forgive me and God save me. Sorry, you're not on the list. No Santa Claus for you this year. No presents. So we are seeing some, some things, I think, come together. And again, I, I apologize. I've been a little bit under the weather with this cold, so I didn't get that information that I should have gotten to you related to your final project. But I promise you, I will have the midterm exam. I promise you. They would rather have your cold prevent that. And and also I will have I will have the worksheet. And as I told you again, the worksheet can be submitted. And you will tell me at the bottom. The worksheet is something you do with your handwriting. You fill in the four categories. So it's four pages. You write it out. And at the end you say, Professor, I want to submit this as my final project. If you want to wait till you get home and fine tune it, edit a little bit, add to a little bit, then write that at the bottom as you hand this in to me Friday. Professor, I would prefer to add more. I will be sending it to you in two weeks by email. So either way, that's your choice. And if you're
your, I know some of you, as I, I said, I understand some of you are going back to a heavy schedule. And I'm, I'm one too. I've got kids asking me from church all kinds of questions. I've got to get back and talk to my students. <laughs> Tell them what it's about and show them pictures. <laughs> and explain to them why I wasn't there last Wednesday night when they had pepperoni pizza. Let's go on to the next page. The bottom of page 18. It is wonderful how the plain setting forth of God's word is called a theory and so grand and avoided. A presiding elder was speaking to a sanctified <laughs> preacher on his district and said, I recognize your lovely spirit, excellent life, and faithful ministry, but I cannot endorse your theory. The preacher replied, well, here is a remarkable thing. Suppose I am presented with an apple which is large and rosy, has a pleasant smell and a delicious taste. And I say to it, apple, you are large, rosy, fragrant, and luscious, but I cannot endorse the tree that grew you. Now, brother, this speech would not be more surprising and unreasonable on my part than yours to be, for you admit that my spirit and life are all right and gospel labor successful, and yet refuse to endorse the very blessing by which I obtained this spirit and achieved this success. He is very keen on making an argument and silencing the opposition. Okay, let's go on to the next one. It's obtainable now. Don't have to wait till later. Now here's the important part, starting on page, looks like 40. The blessing may be lost. In the next chapter, he talks about how it can be regained. We mentioned Finney's use of the term backsliding. But can you lose your sanctification? Can you lose your holiness? Anyone know someone who was sanctified and turned away from God and led a very degenerate life? I've already got my hand up. Yes. Sometimes it happens. The blessing may be lost. At the bottom of the page, 40, and this again is the same argument my missionary Baptist friend gives me down in Bartles. We're best friends, so we talk with, with uh, out fighting, but we just talk. And I asked him about the people who fall away. And he said, well, they were never saved in the first place. Otherwise, they wouldn't fall away. Good Baptist yeah. answer. Yeah. So look at this. When therefore such cases are reported, it causes some to doubt that the fact that the fallen one ever had the grace. Now, this is saying the same argument for those who had sanctification. Others make it an argument defense for the rejection of the blessing. So why would I need something that I can lose? In what respect, say they, is sanctification superior to regeneration, if it can be lost? The last point is plausible and it is not without force. Next page, 41, at the first hearing. But it falls to pieces, however, by the simple statement that our moral probation is not over at sanctification. And we may not only lose the grace of heart purity, but the soul itself between the point of the time called today and the gates of the world. Mm. Psalm 95, Hebrews in chapter 4, repeats this. Actually, the book of Hebrews repeats Psalm 95 several times. If you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation the time of testing in the wilderness. When in Meribah and Ma Masa, they challenged me and provoked me, although they had seen all of my works. Forty years I endured that generation. I said, they are people whose hearts go astray. They don't know my ways. She killed Kushibu. <laughs> Psalm 95. 
So this psalm is actually <clears throat> one that gives warning. And again, maybe it was three times that it was repeated in the book of Hebrews. Emphasizing you can. So stay awake. Today is the day of salvation. Be alert. Be on guard. Get your dukes up. Because the devil is coming after you. And you just don't know. And also the heart. Prone to wander. Lord I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. You know that hymn right? Yes. By the way did you know that the, the church of the Nazarene changed the words? To that hymn they were offended that you could lose your uh, holiness. Prone to wander Lord I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. They changed that. I've got the. Nazarene hymnal somewhere and I, I remember singing it one time I thought why would they change that well it was a Calvinist hymn so it has to be changed and they changed it so it's, it's not that I want to leave uh, but I'm always tethered to the Lord something like that so I would not leave I would never leave him I can't Sanctific bottom of page 41 while sanctification may be lost Yet it is unspeakably better while it is retained than the regenerated experience as far as perfect love and peace. So there, he's, Beverly Caroline is saying, well, you know, if this is something I can lose, people say, why would I even want it? Right. If you can lose it. Well, guess what? You ever hear of marriage and divorce? Have you heard of marriage and divorce? Are, are there some people who say, I'm never going to get married because I might get divorced? <laughs> Did you say that when you were being married? Well, I don't know. Might have to jump. Might have to step away from this one because it, no telling, I could be one of those statistics. I could be divorced in two or three years. Did you have that feeling? Honestly? Nope. Why? I feel if I went in with that attitude, I would be more prone to <laughs> but why did you not have that, Dr. Vermillion? Why did you not have that when you married Diana? How many years ago? How many years ago? 55? 55. 56. Wow. Congratulations. But why did you not? Because we both had made commitments to the Lord. Commitments Amen. to the Lord and to each other. To each other. Amen. And you remember that one, till death? Do us part. In the book of common prayer, till death do us part. So that is not a reason to be a, avoiding that you could lose it or you could end up shipwrecked. No, you continue to seek the Lord in holiness. Now, it may be lost. Let's go to page 49. Page 49 describes an experience of ecstasy, joy, and how some people, when they get sanctified, they will shout. Um, I don't know about your cultures, but in the United States, the inner church holiness and the camp meetings that have been going on in, in more conservative circles, they have people who shout. And sometimes it will scare you to death. This, this brother or sister over here, sometimes 80 years old, and they're just sitting there, and all of a sudden, they just, all of a sudden, it comes out. A shout of joy. Hallelujah! Oh, did that scare you? And then, also, there are people who get up and run around. Do they do that in Nepal? In the middle of the revival service or worship service, someone just gets up and runs. I don't have the energy to do it. But just runs around. And around. Bishop, have you done that? I see. Okay. Sometimes, okay. People just get so happy. So happy. So much ecstasy and joy. And you can praise the Lord. Jump up. Some people dance. Now, especially Pentecostals do more of the dancing. And you'll see some older people up there just moving around. Koreans don't do that as much in church. But when Hanmani goes to the park with the soju, <laughs> right, have a picnic and they get a little bit intoxicated. You can see that. 
so cute. <laughs> so this feeling of ecstasy, we know people with this gladness who never have overwhelming transports and camp meeting shouting experiences. We know people who have the joy and do not express it. But they possess the quiet inner, underline that, quiet inner joy born of conscience, conscious heart purity, and the indwelling Christ. And that is read unmistakably in the happy smile, the deep restful look in the eyes, and the unruffled peace that literally beams in the shining face. What are they saying? What's he saying here? Sometimes people who have the true experience are not that is not that expressive. That's right. And you might say, well, I don't think Sister So and so is actually saved and sanctified because she's so quiet. She's got it inside. She's got it inside. And you don't have to let that fountain bust out. Mm. Sometimes Amen. the fountain can be within. The joy is within. And especially that smile. Oh, I tell you, when I see someone who's a, a person that's had that experience of grace in their lives, and they just have this quiet smile, and you just know they're at peace with the Lord. It's, it's just a wonderful picture. And I, I have some people in my church like that. Some of them in their 80s, some in their 90s. Betty Sparks last, uh, actually Sunday, June 25th, was her 99th birthday. She's on hospital. She's in a hospital bed. You go to her house, she's there with where her daughter lives, and she has the most beautiful smile. Mm, be attending. And, and also she, she loves for me to take her picture, but she always says, Pastor, I need to get my hair done first. <laughs> so she tells her daughter to bring a mirror and a brush so she can make sure her hair looks good before I take the picture. Quiet joy. <coughs> Quiet joy. Maybe sometimes we can even be suspicious of people who are a little bit too loud and loud all the time. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying you have to start suspecting people of being fake, but yeah, some people are just a little bit too loud and too expressive. And now it's time for a break again. Can you believe it? So we will finish this today and start on the other book and we're ahead of schedule so thank you all for being such good listeners and good discussers so we'll see you in how about 15 minutes some of you might need a little more time to take a break get some coffee or wash your face take a shower <laughs> on his knees. Uh-oh. Deal in prayer. Hope to see you there. Oh, you need to do that picture. Send it to you. Yeah, that dress. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Glad to be able to do it. Yeah, they just keep blocking this. I can't even read the screen. They block it, and I have to put it out, and it pops up again. Is it really from the cafe, or is it junk? 
Well, I had my captive but I'm not going to renew. They okay. want me to renew. So it happens in our church computer too. They keep bothering me. You didn't renew, and you know your, your computer is at risk. If you don't renew and send us $300, then you're going to have all kinds of problems. Well, especially true if they spot you're overseas. When I was in Taiwan, I got all kinds of messages. But the field leader, the then field leader, said that was real common because there was so much stuff going on in Taiwan. Oh. So. Yeah, I just closed it. I have But I'm sorry, that's an, a, more than a nuisance when you're trying to present. Well, I know, it covers the screen. <laughs> exactly. Not good. Okay, here's the Okay, so I'll send this to the office so I can have it printed. Well, yes, you're talking about the the quiet, the quiet spirit. Uh, my brother and his wife were uh, soon out of college and uh, did the rounds to be music evangelists uh, in some of these camp meetings. But within a year or so, and, and they did it at churches as well. And um, but within a year or so, uh, they weren't being asked to come back. Uh. Big deal was that Rob, my brother, well, he had a beautiful voice and, and led singing, and he played the piano, and his wife played the organ, and they they had a wonderful duet. Um, he was he was not demonstrative. Oh, very quiet, yeah. but very you know. Was it the Liberace style? <laughs> yeah, and. Um, uh, his father-in-law, who, who was yeah, fifty-five, fifty-five. So this in year, Indiana and oh. Ohio area. Ah, shouldn't say this year. Um, this is fifty-five so years. Uh, next year, fifty-six. Uh, yeah, long he'll, time. He'll never, we are old people. Never be able to do this <laughs> on a regular basis. I know. I also want to say the same thing. You know, and uh, you know, it's just really sad. It was really yeah. sad. I mean, there are people that it's natural, it comes out that way, but some people it's fake. I'm yeah. sorry, I, I see something with that. Are they that happy? Yeah. We had a kid that uh, was prone that, prone that way, and he's, he's good in practice. Uh, it's usually put off, and sometimes he can get to sing with somebody because well, he made a mistake rather than moving through it and retrieving it he'd get blessed and he'd start you know cover, try to cover his mistake and that was supposed to those, those kind of things were terribly disconcerting to me Yeah. 
Yeah, I think so. But, you know, my voice may not sound like it, but no. if I sleep well tonight, I'll be in doing really well. Mm. Are you going to take another one this evening after supper? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But Moses, I've sent him two emails letting him know that I'm not well, and so, but he's supposed to come down here at 4 o'clock. Oh. Um, I forget his last name. Is it Kim? Kim? Kim. Moses, Dr. Moses Kim. Actually, not many Koreans will use Moses as their first, as their yeah, American or English name. So I used to hear Moses Kim. He left India. He was working with the ECI, correct? Yeah, how many years? Someone listening to Pan Yeah. You got it? Oh, yeah. Wow. I, I'm Korean. Oh, I know. <laughs> you love it, Korean culture. Anybody, someone, uh, anybody need Americano? No. Yeah. Right. Hazel. 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 Do you want to try? No? What is it? Coffee? It's okay. okay. I do not do coffee. Oh, so okay. thank you. Oh, I'm doing hot water. Yes, sir. 